A good morning, Hope Church. Good to see wow, you guys are energetic. You're here. You're ready to go. Thank you so much for joining us for worship on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, whether you're in-house or whether you're joining us from abroad, uh, across the country, across the world this morning, thank you for being here with us in worship. And we got some exciting news for next week. Because the last few weeks, we've had live worship in here at 8, 9, 30, and 11. Starting next week, we're also going to have live worship um, at what well, all our campuses, North Campus too, but over in the Family Life Center in the gym at 9, 30, and 11, we'll have live worship there too. Um, so if you want to go and experience worship over there too, we feel free to do that. Feel free to be in here. Uh, we'll have this continuing to go on too. So join us, continue to join us in worship, and also um, I ask that you continue to join us as you're able on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock uh, for our virtual prayer service, uh, for a powerful time of prayer as we continue to seek out God in this time, as we continue to seek out His wisdom uh, through these stages of reopening, through these stages of what's next, as we continue to look to Him uh, for our guidance, look to Him for our hope. Um, so 7 o'clock, Wednesday nights, uh, it's through Zoom. Uh, you can join Pastor Gary for that. We'll be praying with you. And um, you can find the, the info on that, uh, the Hope Church app, on the Facebook page, and our, and our Hope Church website too. Now we uh, just want to say a big thank you to our tech team. Because we've had a tech team that's been working overtime for the last couple of months um, with trying to make that quick transition to full online services, to, to adding different elements, to trying to make it work seamlessly. And they have been, it's been incredible, the work they put in, and we're so thankful for them. But we're also in need of help, uh, one, to give them a little bit of a break, too, so we can have a, get back to more of a rotation on our tech team. Um, so if you would be interested, if, uh, talking to Chris, he said, you know, if you're someone that's not, that's, that's comfortable with technology. There's training available. You don't have to know all the ins and outs of what each of the roles entails. They'll train you, uh, but just have that comfort level with technology. But if you're interested in being part of what's quickly become a growing ministry of Hope Church, uh, please contact Pastor Chris and see how you can get connected uh, with, with that ministry. Well, it's great to get to be with you this morning uh, in worship, to get to sing together, lift up the name of Jesus, whether you're here in this room with us or joining us at North Campus or joining us in uh, your living room, in a small group setting, whatever it is. And as we get ready to sing this morning, I um, just wanted to share a few thoughts with you to kind of prepare us for worship, to get our hearts ready to, to lift up the name of Jesus today. And with the holiday weekend going on right now, my family has got to and will continue to get to spend some time at the lake, um, which is a favorite place of my daughter's for sure. She, she loves being there. And even though she's going to get some extra time there uh, with the extra day we've got this weekend, I know on the drive home Monday, the complaint is going to be, I wish we had one more day. I wish we could spend one more night. She, she can never get enough. She's never satisfied with the amount of time that we get to spend there. And today we're moving into another piece of our um, unsinkable series, and we're looking at the life of Moses. And I don't know for sure how Moses feels about going to the lake, uh, but one thing I do know as you read through Moses' life in the Old Testament is that he was never completely satisfied with where he was with God. He was never content with what he had seen, with how much he knew of God. He always wanted more. And I think that's clearly displayed in a conversation that he has with God in Exodus 33, it reads this way. It says, Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. And then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And I think that request is an interesting one at the end of that passage because at this point in Moses' life, he's seen a lot of God's glory. He's seen the burning bush. He's talked with God. He's seen the plagues come upon Egypt. He's seen the Red Sea parted. He's seen manna come from heaven to sustain his people. You'd think that would be enough for someone, but he still says, God, I want to see your glory. 
I want to know more of you. Give me a bigger picture of who you are. And this morning, as we gather in worship today, my hope is that that would be the, the cry of our hearts as well. That regardless of what we've seen of God's faithfulness of his glory in our lives, that we would say, God, I want to know you better today. And that sentiment is, is echoed in this first song. So would you stand with us this morning as we join in worship and seek God's face together.
Father, we praise you this morning for that living hope. We praise you for hope that sustains us, that sees us through every circumstance of life. We thank you that today we can choose to be glad in this day because you've given it to us. You've made it. As we continue to worship you, God, we rest in that hope and that strength this morning. We thank you for speaking to us here today and pray that you would continue to be honored and, and glorified as we sing your praise. See you. 
you for your faithfulness to us. Well, you've shown yourself to be true and always good, even over these last few months of uncertainty, of difficulty. We rest in that hope today. We thank you for our faith that carries us through the storms. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Well, have you ever noticed? I'm, I'm sure you have. Decisions. We all make decisions, right? Some of them good, and then some of them not so much. Some sources su suggest that we actually make up to 35,000 choices every day. That seems a little on the high end to me, but uh, that's what the experts say. So everything from, should I sleep in or work out, right? Herbal tea or an ice cold mocha frappuccino with whipped cream and chocolate syrup dribble, drizzled over it. Should I wear my red chocks or my teal chocks? These are big decisions, right? Mask or no mask? Church in person or church online? Decisions. Uh, parents these days are wrestling with the choice, do I want to bring my kids and grapple with them in the middle of the worship service, right? And so last Sunday I had to chuckle. Our third service had just dismissed, and I hear this voice from the back of the room, is it over? <laughs> uh, parents, we don't want you to get... Uh, too frazzled about little noise, little disturbance at your children. You know, I've always said I'd rather hear a baby cry than a saint snore, right? <laughs> decisions, decisions. We all make decisions. And each decision, of course, carries consequences with it. Some good and then sometimes some very bad. There wasn't a happier young athlete in America than Len Bias on the afternoon of June 17, 1986. The NBA draft in New York City felt for him was only 10 minutes old when NBA Commissioner David Stern called Bias's name. And as expected, the University of, University of Maryland All-American All was selected by the world champion Boston Celtics as their second pick in the draft. I mean, Len Bias had everything going for him. Guy had popularity and fame, incredible athletic talent. In fact, many compared it to that of Michael Jordan. Wealth, yeah, besides his lucrative contract with the Celtics, he was about to sign a five-year endorsement package with Reebok Sports for $1.6 million. But then 40 hours later, Bias, age 22, was dead of cardiorespiratory arrest brought on by the use of cocaine. Decisions. We all make decisions, and, and each decision carries consequences with it. Some very good, and then sometimes some very tragic. To bring a copy of the Word of God with you today, uh, let's head in the direction of Hebrews chapter 11. That's where we've been camping out in recent weeks. 
and that's where we'll spend the bulk of our time this morning. Let me just pause at this point to say that Hope Missionary Church is one church, but we're grateful that we can meet in a variety of locations. So hey to the gang at the other end of the building. Greetings, North Campus. Hello to you that are in your family room setting today. Wherever you might be joining us, we're pleased that you can be part of this study today. Our series, of course, is called Unsinkable, subtitled Faith That Weathers the Storms. And so we've been exploring this portrait gallery of faith found in Hebrews 11. Thus far in our series, Abel has taught us what it means to worship God by faith. Enoch has illustrated what it means to walk with God by faith. Noah has shown us what it means to watch for God by faith. Abraham last week was all about waiting on God by faith. Today we're going to look at Moses. Moses was stood for God by faith. He teaches what it means to withstand. What withstand? That the whole idea here is to resist, to hold out against the lure and the enticements of this world system. It's a withstanding faith. Again, no surprise to find the name of Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, 11 times, 11 times in this letter, more than any other New Testament letter, we find the name of Moses. And so if you have the text open there, we're going to dive in at verse 23. Verse 23 tells us this, By faith Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. I'm, I'm guessing that a good portion of us here today are probably familiar with the backdrop. If not, you can... Uh, you can bring yourself up to speed by examining Exodus chapter 2. Read Exodus chapter 2 later today. Three-month-old baby Moses had been placed in a basket covered with pitch, placed in the Nile River. His parents had done so. They had done so because of Pharaoh's decree to exterminate all the male Hebrew babies. But then in the providence of God, Pharaoh's daughter just happened to be using that section of the Nile to bathe. And she just happened to stumble across the child. And she just happened to feel incredible sympathy for him. And you'll remember Moses' sister there is spying on the entire operation, right? And she offers to find a Hebrew woman who can nurse the child. Pharaoh's daughter says, I think that's an excellent idea. And so she actually pays Moses' mother to care for her own child until the time for him to be adopted into Pharaoh's family. How cool is that? Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up. So we're jumping into the story now. He's a mature man. In fact, if we look at Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, he indicates to us that Moses at this time is about 40 years old. It was about that stage in life when he's, in, he's confronted with an incredibly tough decision. Moses has to make a choice. And that's where we're going to focus our attention today, verses 24 through 26, Hebrews 11. Let me just give you the whole passage that we're going to be examining so you kind of get the, the overview, okay? We'll get the big picture here. I'm picking it up at verse 24. By faith Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. There is an outline available on the Hope Church app, if you have downloaded that and want to access that pretty easy today. And so once again, if you want to grab a scrap of piece of paper, if you brought a notebook with you, two distinctives, two distinct, what does a withstanding faith look like? We're going to see two distinctives in this passage. The first one is this, distinctive number one, a withstanding faith rejects the seductions of this world. Certainly that was true in Moses' life, and we're going to see that in a number of occasions here. What specifically did Moses walk away from? Well, the text mentions three, three privileges, and see if you can find, there's one in verse 24, there's one in verse 25, there's one in verse 20. So if you want to kind of work ahead of me and see if you can identify those. First of all, verse 24, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
He refused to be known as the grandson of Pharaoh. The grandson of Pharaoh. So we're talking about position, we're talking about power, we're talking about popularity and fame. Some scholars actually believe that had Moses stayed, he might have, he might have become a, a tremendous statesman. The Jewish historian Josephus was convinced that Moses was actually destined to inherit the throne itself. The most powerful throne of the world at that time. Not only that, but look, verse 25, he refused to enjoy the pleasures of sin. Is sin pleasurable? Absolutely. Sure it is. We we wouldn't do it if it wasn't fun, right? It's fun for a season. And there was every opportunity to explore salacious sensuality and physical delights in that carnal culture of Egypt. Finally, you see there, verse 26, he refused the treasures of Egypt. He refused the treasures. So we're talking incredible wealth. We're talking incredible resources here. Back on November 26, 1922, a guy by the name of Howard Carter made archaeological history by unearthing the tomb of King Tutankhamen, or his friends sometimes called him King Tut, or King Toot, I guess, I guess if you want to call him King Toot. Maybe not, maybe not. What made the discovery, what made the discovery so extraordinary is that Howard Carter found the tomb largely still intact, with that inner room still undisturbed, The wealth that was buried with this boy king was astounding. They discovered over a thousand pounds of gold, along with many other treasures. In fact, it took 10 years to excavate and carefully catalog all this stuff. Are you kidding me? You say, Gary, where where are you going with all this? Well, think about it. There are actually some scholars who believe that King Tut may have been the pharaoh mentioned here in the book of Exodus. We can't say for sure. Either way, either way, King Tut is just one small surviving example from the many rulers of Egypt at that time, which was the richest and most powerful nation in the world. What that means is these are exactly the kind of treasures that Moses walked away from. These would have been part of his inheritance. No one has ever found the burial place of Moses. But if you did, you wouldn't find any of this. How come? Because he made a decision to reject the world system. Moses looked at the riches of Egypt and all that he would have, the gold, the silver, the diamonds, the servants, the plush living quarters, and all the fame that went along with being a prince, potentially even a prince to the heir of the throne. And like the apostle Paul testifies in Philippians chapter 3, he said, you know what, it's all garbage. It's all rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ. I can't help but wonder. Here's the question I've been asking myself this week. You ask yourself. Would I make that same choice? Had those options been given to me? Would Would I make that same decision? Back in the summer of 2013, a kid by the name of Ethan Couch got behind the wheel of his dad's truck after drinking alcohol, swallowing Valium, and smoking pot. It's a joyride that ended with him slamming into a stalled SUV at 75, excuse me, 70 miles an hour, killing four, paralyzing his passenger for life. While Ethan Couch walked away from that accident relatively unscathed. At his court hearing, psychologist Dick Miller testified that Ethan suffered from affluenza. Not influenza, we've heard a lot about that. This was afflu. What in the world is affluenza? The inability to understand the consequences of his actions because of financial privilege. In other words, we could say it like this. He was too rich to know right from wrong. 
affluenza. Here's my question. Is it possible, gang, is it, is it just perhaps possible that the church in 21st century America is suffering from affluenza? I don't know. I don't know. It's true, we don't have the position of privilege in the house of Egypt that was available to Moses, but let's just be honest today, can we? The potential to experience and indulge ourselves in many of, this, many of the pleasures of this world are for the most part within our grasp, at least to some extent. And more often than not, those pleasures conflict with a life of faith, don't they? These these things, this existence, whether we purchase them or pile them up in our homes or pursue them with an insatiable hunger, can actually end up pulling us away, right? They, they draw us away from the love of God and to, to an attachment and love for this world. That's why the Apostle John would write these words in his first letter. Don't love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. For everything in this world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. This world and its desires will pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. I'm guessing that maybe for some of you that might be listening to me today, I read that, and that almost might sound like a foreign language. I mean, the terms worldly, worldliness, they've all but disappeared from our vocabulary, have they not? And I wonder, gang, I wonder, have, have we let down our guard against worldliness? The distinctions between holy and worldly conduct that were once clear seem to have been blurred beyond recognition. And I'm afraid, I'm, I'm afraid that a love for the things of this world is infiltrating the church. It, it's watering down and weakening our witness. Charles Spurgeon thought so. He actually recorded these words 150 years ago, and yet I think they reflect an accurate assessment of where we find ourselves in these days. Spurgeon said, I believe that one reason why the Church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. I've asked you this question before, uh, but it certainly fits our discussion today, and it, it convicts me every time I read the question, so I think, hey, why not share it with you? Right? I shouldn't be the only guy in the room under conviction, right? I mean, that, that wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be fair. So imagine I'm given an assignment. My, my task is to identify the genuine follower of Jesus Christ. My choices are an unbeliever and you. And I'm given two reports detailing things like conversations and internet activity and manner of dress and iPod playlists and television habits and hobbies and leisure time and financial, tra financial transactions and thoughts and passions and dreams. So here's the question, would I be able to tell you apart? Would I, would I discern a difference between you and your unconverted neighbor, your unconverted coworker, your unconverted classmate or friend? Or have the lines between holy and worldly conduct in your life, between holy and worldly conduct in my life, become so indistinguishable that there's really not that much difference at all? You would have been able to tell a difference in Moses' life. It would have been obvious. Because a withstanding faith rejects the seductions of this world, and that's exactly what he did. Distinctive number two, a withstanding faith reveres, or maybe we, I was looking for an R word, probably should have just stuck with embraces, embraces the sufferings of the Christ. Embraces the sufferings. 
Moses did more than break away from the family of Pharaoh. Moses spurned the greatest treasures of this world, but what did, it's not only what he resisted, what he rejected, but look what he signed up for to face mistreatment and disgrace. It, it was a choice that brought with it tremendous sacrifice. It says here, he chose to be mistreated. He chose to be mistreated with the people of God. The word mistreated there, su kaku kaumai. How would you like to learn that one for your Greek vocabulary quiz? Su kaku kaumai. Sug or soon, really, it's a preposition with. Kakueo. Kakos is actually the word for evil, a noun form. Kakukeo would be verb form, to treat badly. So to treat badly with, literally then, to suffer with, to share in persecution. Moses saw the Israelites in their condition. He saw that they were being treated like cattle for the slaughter. He saw that they were beaten, being beaten by their masters. And yet Moses signs up. He chooses the life of a bricklayer slave. A bricklayer slave over against the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, can you imagine the, can you imagine the conversation in, in Egyptian high society? Wait, what? <laughs> Unbelievable. What an idiot. To the outside world, it would have seemed absurd. He was rescued by the daughter of Pharaoh as a baby. He was raised under Pharaoh's influence. In every sense of the word, Moses had it all, and yet he made the choice to walk away from that. He walked away from the, the chance to sit on an earthly throne for the privilege of bowing his knee at a heavenly one. And not only that, verse 26, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. And that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? For the sake of Christ. Did our author here kind of lose sight of chronology of the, the Bible, uh, what in the world did Moses have to do with Christ? He lived roughly 1,500 years before Jesus. That's true. And yet Moses would have recognized the storyline of Scripture. That he, he would have recognized that it rests squarely on the promise of a coming Messiah. He, he was well aware, Genesis 3.15, of God's promise to Eve that one day her seed would crush the serpent's head. Moses also no doubt understood that the sacrificial, the sacrificial system pointed ahead to a redeemer. Moses himself recorded these words in Deuteronomy, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites, you need to listen to him. So Moses, he spoke that in reference to the Messiah. He was looking for the one who would redeem Israel. And, and thus the reproach that he endured because he identified with the Israelites bore witness to the reproach that Christ would bear for his people. Or I could say it like this. He was identifying with Christ in his suffering. When, when Moses made that choice, he was identifying with Christ in his suffering. The same Christ, by the way, whom the author of the Epistle to the Hebrews is encouraging his readers now to identify with. Remember that the original recipients of this letter were, were in the middle of it. We've talked about that. They were experiencing hardships. Many of them were losing their homes. Many of them were losing their possessions because of their allegiance to Jesus, because of their faith. Some were being imprisoned. Some were being persecuted. They were facing a decision. They're facing a choice. Should we walk away? Should we chuck this Christianity thing and enjoy the pleasures of this life, at least for a while? Should we bail? Should we walk away from Jesus? And our author here is challenging them, make the right choice. Make the wise choice. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. Hupamane. You need to stay under the pressure. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Can you see it there? You need to persevere just like Moses did, right? Right? not only challenging the 
first century readers, he's challenging the 21st century readers. We need to persevere. Admittedly, we're not facing the same oppression that Moses signed up for, but we do have brothers and sisters around the world today, brothers and sisters in Christ in other locations of this, on this planet that are facing those same types of extreme challenges that were on the screen just a second ago. And even here in the States, the climate is changing. The temperature is clearly changing. There was a story in the news just this week. Maybe you saw it. First Pentecost... First Pentecostal Church in Holly Springs, Mississippi. They've been battling the authorities over the lockdown harassment. And what happened? Their building burned to the ground. Arsonists blew it up. And before leaving, the arsonists actually painted these words in, in the church parking lot. Uh, it said, Bet you stay home now, you hypocrites. The arsonists really should have been spent more, more time in spelling class than what they did there. But, and that's one example, one example of many that could be cited to, to illustrate the growing tension that we as believers are now facing in our culture. But the reality is this. That shouldn't surprise us, okay? It shouldn't surprise us because the Bible repeatedly warns us that suffering is part of the Christian journey. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul also said over in Philippians chapter 1, for it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Or Peter, the Apostle Peter, put it like this in his first letter. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering as though something strange were happening. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. I'll give you one more. Here's the words of Jesus where he said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because of, of, of me, Jesus was saying, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I could give you more. I think you probably get the idea. Here's what it comes down to. What are we willing to endure for the sake of following Christ? What are we willing to give up and let go of and to, in order to fully embrace the sufferings of Jesus? I ran across a devotional this past week. It was written by Bill Eliff, and I, I like the way he put it. It was an article entitled, The God Who Relaxes Our Grip. And, and here's what Bill wrote. He said, it begins in the crib. We hold things tightly, like a pacifier or toy. Progressing through each stage of life, we always find a new ob object to grasp. Maybe a baseball bat, a diploma, keys to a car, home, our wallet, a job, a relationship, our independence. The objects are, 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 are endless. But if we will follow Christ, he will gently but firmly be about the business of showing us anything that we're holding tightly that is detrimental to our lives and his purpose. He's not being mean, but gracious. He knows where we need to relax our grip. And he also knows the beautiful things that happen when we release anything that has become more important to us than him. Bottom line, holy living doesn't mean abstaining from pleasure. Holy living means recognizing Jesus as the source of life's greatest pleasures. The goal is to find our satisfaction in him. Moses had a withstanding faith because he rejected this world and embraced Christ. And just like the man who, who sold everything in order to purchase that pearl of great price, right? Sold everything he had to acquire that pearl of great price. So in the same way, Moses gained something far better. How did he do it? How in the world did Moses pull that off? Look at the end of verse 26, because he was looking ahead to his reward. We've seen this repeatedly in Hebrews 11. Looking ahead to the reward. Faith banks on eternity. 
Yes, in the short term, Moses had to endure ill treatment with a bunch of refugee slaves in the wilderness. But in the light of eternity, much like the, the Apostle Paul described, he said, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with a glory that will be revealed in us. It's not worth comparing. Paul would later say uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. And so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Following Christ means we weigh the passing momentary pleasures of sin over against eternal separation from God. Following Christ means weighing momentary affliction against, over against eternal joy in heaven. Those are the options. And you're going to have to decide. You're going to have to choose. What's it going to be for you? We've seen what Moses decided. What will you decide? I began this morning by sharing the story of Lynn Bias. He made a tragic decision. Let me tell you about another young man who made a poor choice. He felt like a failure, and so he actually attempted to take his own life by ingesting poison. Fortunately, it was a failed attempt, and he was rushed to the hospital. While there, a local Christian worker brought him a Bible and told his mother to read from John 14. John 14 contains Jesus' words to Thomas, the Apostle Thomas, who was the first missionary to India. And when this young man heard verse 19, those words resonated in his soul. John 14, 19, because I live, Jesus said, you also will live. This young man thought, this might be my only hope, a new way of living, life as defined by the author of life. And then this young man, after making a very bad decision, made a very good decision. He made the choice to commit his life to Christ, and he prayed these words. He said, Jesus, if you're offering me life like I've never had it, I want that life from you. Please get me out of this hospital bed well, and I promise I will leave no stone unturned in my pursuit of truth. He was true to that promise. And for the next 57 years, he not only pursued truth, but he became one of the most skilled defenders of truth in our generation. This past Tuesday, Ravi Zacharias was greeted with these words, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Ravi made the right decision. He made the choice to reject this world system and embrace Christ. I'll ask you again, what about you? The team is going to come and they're going to lead us in a closing worship song this morning. And a portion of those lyrics will go like this. My foes are many, they rise against me, but I will hold my ground. There it is, right? There's that withstanding faith. I'm going to hold my ground. I'm not going to cave in. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to walk away. I'm not going to forsake the faith. I'm going to persevere. I will hold my ground. I will not fear the storm. That's an unsinkable faith, isn't it? That's an unsinkable faith. My confidence is in God because he's always, always, always dependable. We can trust him to see us through whatever storm we might be going through today. Let's thank him for that. Reflect on these lyrics as the team leads us. Let's stand and worship God together. Till 
always, always. Give us that confidence. Lord, help us to persevere amidst the challenges, amidst the battles and temptations and trials that come our way. And we keep our focus on Jesus. Our hope is in you. Let go of the things of this life. Let go of the things of this existence that are holding us back from being the disciple that you've called us to be in these days. Help us to carefully evaluate, God. Is there anything that we're holding on to tightly? 
and it's interfering with our walk and relationship with you. We want to be first and foremost about passionately pursuing you above everything else in this existence. Give us the focus and strength to do that, I pray. Empower us by your spirit to go from this place and make a difference for you. We pray in Christ's name, and everybody agreed, said, amen, amen. God bless, thanks for coming. Lord bless you, have a great week.